Hello, BookTube. I'm continuing with my library tour for 2022. I am not at my library. I am in someone else's home library, so I'm not doing pulling books off the shelf. Uh, instead, I'm going through books that I have had in the past. Uh, so a library of the lost for this library tour. Uh, and I'm still uh, getting the hang of this BookTube thing. I'm, I'm still experimenting with where to sit and how to angle the light, but I am figuring it out. And another thing that I uh, I think worked fairly well last time was to show you the book covers on my phone instead of on my iPad. To just hold, them, hold the phone up to the screen. So I'm going to try and do that again this time around and see if I can maybe make it eat, look even better. Uh, we're going to start with a contemporary novel. I scanned all of these things on a flatbed scanner years and years ago. Uh, and this one, you can see uh, I scanned my review copy, uh, but I don't know that I ever reviewed the book. This is by Ron Curry, and it's Everything Matters, uh, with, an, with an exclamation point. Uh, surprisingly, deceptively complex novel. I mean, on one level, it's about a kid who thinks that the world is going to end when he gets to the doorstep of his midlife crisis, that it's literally going to end, that he's going to die. Uh, but on, on, you have to, you have to, the novel is not being completely straight with you, and no one is completely reliable in it. The, so you have to sort of hold on and dig a little deeper. It repays a rereading. Uh, I read it, as is my usual custom, if you watch this channel, you'll know, I read it uh, the first time when I got an advanced copy, and then I read it again when I got the finished copy. And th it, there was a case where I, I really benefited from the reread, because there's lots that the author was doing in this book that I didn't get the first time. Uh, okay, <laughs> well, our next one is not deceptively complex. It's very simple. This is epic fantasy. This is Dennis McKernan, and this is The Eye of the Hunter. Fairly nice standard fantasy cover there. Uh, this is set in the world of Mythgar, where uh, periodically a, a astronomical phenomenon appears in the sky, a baleful astronomical phenomenon called the Eye of the Hunter. And when that happens, uh, to, to paraphrase Sherlock Holmes, the powers of evil are exalted. <laughs> and, uh, and in this particular instance, well, as you can tell from the cover, in this particular instance, when the powers of evil are exalted because of the Eye of the Hunter, a band, or we might even say fellowship, <laughs> of disparate beings from disparate mythological races band together uh, in order to pursue a MacGuffin and push back the, the, the wave of evil. In other words, you won't find anything new in this book. You won't find anything inventive in this book. And if I remember correctly, you won't find anything all that interesting in this book either. <laughs> Although maybe if I found this, I think this came out as a mass market paperback and then was reissued as a trade paperback and has never seen the light of day since. So if I were, you know, book hunting and I came across the mass market paperback or the trade paperback of this and maybe the rest of the books in the series, I might give it another try just, just to see if my memories of it are that it were, like for instance, we saw yesterday, uh, Hawk's Grey Feather, book one of the Celtia. Now that is a, a fantasy slash science fiction, an SFF series that does work. It it works for its supper. I don't think this one does. I think this is really meant to be epic fantasy uh, comfort food. Uh, but if I if I saw it again, I would I would probably try it again uh, in case I was just being overly judgmental the first time. Uh, then this next one actually came up in uh, a recent Q and A. Uh, I don't I have a scanned cop uh, scanned issue image of the cover, but I don't have the book anymore. No idea why I would get rid of this. This is Duncan Wu's biography of William Hazlitt, the first modern man. <laughs> why you would want to be that, I don't know. But this uh, the, my favorite book about Hazlitt uh, is a big old book of about him as a critic. So you details of his biography get worked into that book, but it's mostly just a vocational biography. Uh, this is different from that, uh, and I enjoyed it immensely. I don't know, this was from an academic press, I think this was from Yale, or maybe Princeton, I, but I have no idea why I would get rid of this, <laughs> but I did. Uh, as soon as I saw the image, I realized I didn't have the book. Oh, okay. All right, this next one is Stephen Healy. I have recommended this book many, many times. This is a novel that you should read. <laughs> you are going to love it. You are going to love it. It is as close to a surefire, across-the-board recommendation as novels come. It's called How I Became a Famous Novelist. Uh, and it's about a, a schmuck main character who wants to uh, become a New York Times bestselling author 
for one reason and one reason only. He doesn't have any artistic calling <laughs> at all. He wants to become a New York Times bestselling novelist so that he can rub that fact in the face of his ex-girlfriend when he attends her wedding to someone else. <laughs> and he goes about it. I mean, that's his plan. That's what he wants to do. He wants to rub her face in what a success he is. But first he has to become a New York Times bestselling author, and so he has to figure out how that's done. How do you become a New York Times bestselling author? And what results is a hilarious, scathing takedown of the the literary world, of the literary machine, of all the different bestselling authors and what they're like. And some easily recognizable types, as well as the hype, the reviews, the machinery, the readings, all that. All of it is, it is just, you, you think at first that it's going to be just swiftly cynical, so that there isn't going to be an island left to stand on, but actually the book does have a heart. It, it, uh, it will, you will love reading about books and publishing and very thinly veiled caricatures of some best-selling authors, but you'll also be happy at the end. The, the, there's a story here as well, and it it's uh, partly about the schmuck main character's personal life, but it's also partly about reading. There's a there there those two threads run throughout the book, and there is a wonderful payoff moment about books, about reading at the end of this book. So it's not all cynicism. Uh, can't recommend it enough. Uh, don't know if it's in print anymore. Don't know if it still has that requisite hideous American cover. Uh, oh, all right. This is the. I scanned this. This was a Pelican mass market paperback of H.D.F. Uh, Kiddo's classic book on the Greeks, uh, which was for 50 years the introductory volume to the ancient Greeks, is that you would, you would find Kiddo. And I'm sure, unlike a lot of other books in this, uh, in this library tour, I'm sure that Kiddo on the Greeks is still in print. It must be. No one's going to let this book go out of print. And, you know, I don't mean to sound withering because it is a really good introduction to the ancient Greeks. If, if you want an overview in book form, something more in-depth than the Wikipedia article on ancient Greece or all of the connected Wikipedia articles on ancient Greece, if you want something uh, done by a classicist, maybe in book form, you couldn't do any worse. You couldn't do any better than than the Greeks by Kiddo. It's still it's a it's a durable uh, introduction. Uh, <laughs> well, all right, uh, we're 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 climbing down from classic history and from books that have durable worth just a bit <laughs> to uh, this is a an anthology of of uh, novellas by Sasha White called Most Wanted. <laughs> this is I, if I remember correctly, this is. Uh, two or three stories uh, about himbos, about bad boys with chiseled cheeks and bad attitudes. <laughs> the kind of the kind of boy, the kind of man you don't take home to mother. <laughs> that sort of thing. Every uh, so, romance novelists love to write about that kind of character, and uh, when romance novelists love to write about their subject, I tend to love reading romance novelists on that subject. Uh, I don't think I still have this. I wish I did. I must have had a paperback at one point or other, but I, I don't anymore. Uh, ah, okay. Ah, wow. I, all right, I, this is a, a paperback. This next one was a paperback. I scanned a paperback. But I'm looking at it now and realizing I don't have a copy of this book. I don't have this in book form at all. And that's an oversight. I really should fix that. Uh, this is Our Town by Thornton Wilder. And... Uh, I'm I'm going to go out on a limb here. Of course, it will be a personal opinion. I will I will state my own personal opinion, my own individual critical judgment. And it's no offense to Tony Kushner, but I I, I feel confident in calling this the greatest American play ever written. No matter how familiar it is, the, maybe it's not familiar as much in the 21st century. In the 20th century, it, it was often quipped, especially by cynical theater people, that there was never a moment anywhere in the world. There was never a moment on the clock in a day when somewhere in the world our town was not being staged somewhere. <laughs> uh, but that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how popular it is. You can understand immediately why this would be performed in every local theater group, school theater group, community theater group, anywhere. Because it literally has no scenery. <laughs> you, the... the the, the uh, actors, you can do it without anything at all, just chairs and tables, uh, and just have the actors do the rest, have the actors pantomime the, the props. Uh, but in addition to that, it's harrowing, 
absolutely harrowing. It it lures you in and takes you by surprise with a, a very folksy narrator, uh, and with very very quotidian folksy detail in the beginning of the play. The beginning of the play is very folksy detail about a small town, uh, but. Once you are pulled in with that folksy detail, it then doesn't let you go. You don't get to go away. You don't get to leave that folksy detail. And so you are there for the harrowing third part of this play. As as harrowing a thing as I have ever read, and yet without trying. It's not trying to, to harrow you or to blow you away or to scare you. It's not trying to do anything like that. Instead, it... Those of you who have who have read or have seen Our Town will know what I'm talking about. Uh, and those of you who have not, there's no parallel that I can draw. You'll just have to either... I'm sure that there are, there are versions of this that are available online to watch. Uh, or, you know, maybe even free on YouTube. There must be. There must be. Uh, but no matter what, if you have not read this, nothing is going to prepare you for the third act. Uh, and I'm... I'm hoping that you will really enjoy it. I, I'm, I'm seeing this thing, this scanned paperback, and I'm thinking, wow, why don't I have a copy of this? That's kind of weird. Uh, I'll have to rectify that. It'll it'll turn out somewhere. It'll turn out probably not all by itself. Probably that's why I got this, is that it was just the play in a little mass market paperback. Usually you see a collection of Thornton Wilder. Uh, pro that's probably where I'll see it. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, all right. Our next book is a criminali book. Apparently, I, apparently, at some point in my distant past, I was criminal. <laughs> uh, this is Poe Must Die by Mark Olin, and it is a terrific, just s sensational, gothic, atmospheric novel about uh, a, a a drunken, destitute, desperate uh, at his wits end, Edgar Allan Poe who suddenly has to face face off against world domineering satanist and and uh and evil people uh it mark olden you doesn't beat you over the head with the research that he obviously did about poe and his day it's it's on every page it's easy to see but it, it, he doesn't beat you over the head with the research instead he tells a great tale just a fantastic fun story I don't know if this is even available. Way too many times up here in Vermont. I have just offhandedly quipped that th this book is out of print, but probably you can find a $2 copy online and then find out that the copies online are $200. <laughs> That's happened way too many times, so I'm not going to I'm not going to confidently quip that anymore. I don't know if you can find a paperback of this. I certainly wish I still had mine. Uh, I gave it away. I give it away all the time when I find it to people who... Uh, want a really good atmospheric historical thriller. That's what this is. Uh, I don't think I'd give it away if I found it again. Uh, oh, okay, this next one is uh, more uh, classics writing. Uh, I guess there's going to be one of those in every one of these <laughs> in one of these library tours as well. This is by Alison Keith. I don't remember which publisher did this, uh, but this is Propertius, Poet of Love and Leisure. Propertius is one of my favorite Roman poets, and uh, this is an in-depth study of pretty much everything that we can know about Propertius, and also a really, really good study of Roman uh, poetry forms, Roman poetry expectations, and uh, line by line the work of Propertius. Uh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure that this is a good introduction to Propertius. You would probably have to know his poetry. It might even help for you to know Latin. Although I don't think so. I don't think that's a, a necessary thing for enjoying this book, but I don't know that this is an introduction uh, to Propertius, which we have seen. We saw a great introduction uh, volume in this library tour called, or I, maybe we haven't got to it yet, called Charm. There was an, a book called Charm, which was a translation of the poetry of Propertius, but also a really good introduction to the poet. I don't think this is that, but I loved it. And again, as with the, the Ovid, was it an Ovid book and uh, a Horace book, something like that? I don't know why, why I got rid of these things. The reason that they're in the Library of the Lost is because I don't have them anymore. And why would I get rid of this? Who would I send it to who wouldn't already have a copy? <laughs> why would I get rid of this at all? No idea. Uh, ah, okay. This one I might still have a copy back at Hyde Cottage. Uh, this is a, an old science fiction novel from Bantam. This is by Richard McEnroe, and it is Skinner. No idea what drew me to the cover. <laughs> Probably the dragon. <laughs> this is this is a science fiction story about uh, 
a hard scrabble alien world that has an indigenous uh, species of dragons, essentially gigantic lizard like creatures whose hides are virtually invulnerable. They are uh, a very valuable commodity, and getting them, being a skinner, is tremendously dangerous, obviously. It's tremendously dangerous. But the dragons uh, aren't the only danger in the book. There's, there's also the, the, you know, the plutocratic bosses that run the lives of the Skinners and rule the trade in Dragonhide. And uh, it's a very well-realized world. Of, it's a, a fairly slim novel, but very good. A very good science fiction novel. Uh, Okay. Uh, all right. This next one is—is uh, is this our last one? No, we have we have a couple more to go. This is by uh, an author. I don't know. This is by Frederick Bush, and I don't know where he stands now. Whether or not he's still writing, whether or not he's still alive, I'm not going to make any any pronouncements about how he surely must be dead. Uh, but also whether or not people read him, I I don't know where his reputation stands right now. But this is a novel of his from years and years ago called Sometimes I Live in the Country. Uh, and you've got the deceptively peaceful Grant Wood cover there, but it is not a peaceful book. It's about a, a young boy and his his uh, widowed father, we think. Uh, this is another case where reading the book with one eye cocked on the reliability of the narrator is a really good idea because there's a lot going on under the surface of the, of the narration here. The narration on the surface is uh, a, a man and his son living on a farm in upstate New York and trying to fit in with the community and whatnot, but there's a lot more going on there, and their versions of why they're there are not to be taken at face value. Parts of them are real, parts of them are reliable, but others aren't. Uh, I remember enjoying this a lot, and it, it made me think, I'm thinking now, why, I know that this, I don't know what this author's, the current state of his literary career is, but I know that it's not huge. I know that he's not, you know, routinely mentioned as a serious heavyweight American author of the late 20th century, and I don't know why. Uh, because I'm the more I remember this book, the more I remember of it that I liked. It was really good, very textured. Uh, I'll have to look into that. I'll have to, I'll have to figure out why that is. Uh, okay, this next one is by Michael and Elizabeth Norman, and this is called Tears in the Darkness. It's a, a history of the Bataan Death March uh, and the events, the events surrounding it as well. And I remember this being a, a visceral gut punch of a book, necess necessarily given the subject. Uh, <clears throat> I also think that this was fairly good with its marshalling of sources. I think, if I remember correctly, the, I mean, the, I don't know in 2022, I'm not sure that any uh, participants in the Bataan Death March are still alive. I think they might all be dead. I think this 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 event may literally have moved into the past. Uh, but this, I don't think it was true when this book was written, and it's it's very, very good. Uh Okay. Uh, this next one is L. Susan Stebbing. This is an old penguin pa or pelican paperback of thinking to some purpose. Stebbing was a philosopher, but this is a book about critical thinking. It's a book about rationality, how you think, how that works. Very, very good. I Again, this is an example where I think I have a copy of the book still, uh, but uh, I love revisiting it. Uh, and then our last book is a, a Western. Oh, no. <laughs> this is Warlock by uh, Oakley Hall. This is a uh, a great Western novel. Oh. <laughs> this is an old mass market paperback, but the book is really, really good. And it was enshrined in a Library of America collection of Westerns. So <laughs> it was Library of America just did a volume of four Westerns, and this was one of them. I was happy to see it because it's a great book. I once had this mass market paperback, which I still did, but I wholeheartedly recommend it to you. If you want a really a West a Western novel that is also good literature then this is one to get. Go and find it. Or, or get that Library of America volume, which is really, really good. Uh, so that's it. That's the last, this, this next installment of the Library of the Lost. As you can tell, uh, several children have come home and the bean is now uh, ballistic with excitement. So I'm going to go uh, take care of her. Uh, but I'll be back. We'll keep doing these. So I will see you soon. Thank you, book two.